This episode is brought to you by Portland Distro. If you like underground music, movies, and more, go to portlanddistro.com for licensed merch, vinyl, CDs, and more. Plug in the discount code 10 off T E N O F F for a 10% discount at portlanddistro.com. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to this week's episode. We've got two of my dear friends, Trevor Shelley Dubrow and Laurent Schroeder Lebec of the Mighty Pelican. I go way back with these guys. Some of Toombs' earliest touring endeavors were with Pelican, so it's really cool to have these guys back on the show. Well, it's Laurent's first time, but Trevor's been on a couple times in the past. Now, as you guys are listening to this, uh, the record, The Fire in Our Throats Will Beckon the Thaw has been reissued by Thrill Jockey. So that was a part of what we talked about on this episode. Before we get going, I want everyone to check out the other Horsemen of the Podcasting Apocalypse shows after they listen to Everything Went Black. Of course, on Mondays, we have Horror Wolf 666, brought to you by Brandon Legion. On Tuesday, we have the best metal podcast on the internet. That is Into the Necrosphere, brought to you by Jackie Smith. On Wednesday, of course, is Everything Went Black Day. Thursday is Necro Thursday, now and forever, with the Necromaniacs Horror Podcast, where I am accompanied by either Mike Scandato or Jeff Kashid to talk about all things horror. And occasionally, all three of us get together. On Sunday, the Lord's Day, we have Carl Haikara's Soul Knox Podcast, which covers all things dark. It covers a lot of ground. Music, films books and right now carl and i are in the beginning of uh, darkness weaves a collaborative effort where we talk about the work of carl edward wagner a criminally underrated weird fiction horror and dark fantasy author and uh, we alternate episodes on everything went black and soul Knox. so we're in the middle of just starting that right now two episodes are out also i'd like to thank our latest patreon supporter thank you very much joe and if you're interested in joining the patreon everything went black legion you can do so for as little as one dollar a month and that gives you access to weekly bonus material as well as a bunch of other shows that only appear on the patreon platform for five dollars a month you get all the bonus stuff plus early access to the regular stream shows. Now, that's a mixed bag because sometimes I'm only a few days ahead of the curve. But right now, we're working on getting a, a bit of a buffer so people can enjoy a couple episodes at a time. For $25, you can become a sponsor of the show. And that means that I will give you an ad read for your project, your band, your business, even your other podcast if you have one going on. So yeah, check that out. Also, I always forget to say this, but follow us on social media or on Instagram, Facebook, and leave us a five-star review on Apple or whatever podcast platform you check out. Guys, I have to say that I'm really excited to be online with both of you gentlemen. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been forever, you know, it's like, uh, well, I feel like Trevor, you and I have spoken fairly recently, but Laurent, I don't, I can't remember the last time I saw you or spoke to you. I can't remember the last time I spoke to a lot of people sometimes, you know, especially because I was just kind of disconnected from a lot of music stuff for a while. Yeah. So now, now that uh, is back to the, uh, the classic lineup, you know, which uh, includes uh, you, Trevor, the bro- the brothers Herwig. Yeah. Ryan and Larry. And, um, and that's, uh, that's, that's a, that's kind of, um, that's a thing. You know, I mean, I was, Dallas was great, you know, um, but 
the original lineup was always special to me, um, primarily because we had some legendary tours together, you know, and that was like some some of my um, favorite memories uh, doing all the stuff has been out with you guys. And I just think, you know, what the ISIS tour we did together. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, well, first time I met you guys and like really met you guys was when we went out with you guys and Wolves in the throne room. And I just think it was just great being on the road with people that you respect and, and develop uh, personal uh, relationships with. So, so that's why I'm glad that the band is, is back to that lineup again. As am I. Yeah. Uh, for precisely the same reasons that you mentioned um, and how I feel about those guys, you know, just being, being in a music making capacity again with three people that you have this sort of, you know, vocal and then also like just kind of organic relationship with just from years of listening to the same stuff being in the same room making music together you know it's i think for people that are not actively making music with each other it can be a hard thing to understand but um it's very uh it's very intimate <laughs> <laughs> so so the um if i remember correctly uh i think it was it was like a family situation like you know you 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 were you know you're married and you're having having uh, your first child and i think that's what kind of took you out of out of the band and everything right is that correct yeah you know um i ask myself that all the time i still kind of you know usually revisit the past and sort of looking at like why did you do things and you know why did you take a left turn and sort of right turn over things are never quite as like linear as you remember them to be usually it's a like convergence of different factors that have like an impact some of it is uh, large some of it is small you know and depending on when you remember the situation you attribute worth and weight to one versus another i certainly for a long time felt the weight of the birth of my first child as like this sort of i need to be home i need to be present it's like a brand new thing for me um i don't know that i ever really even imagined parenthood you know um and right as that sort of like narrative arc was taking place um i think my own past as like the son to my father was also weighing into things. And I think my dad traveled a lot when I was a kid. And I think as I got older and was starting to embrace parenthood, I think it started to really sort of have an impact on me. And I was like, I gotta be, I gotta be home. I gotta make this like be my thing, you know? And so, and so it became front and center for me. And then the, the, the kind of the pressure of like, well, how do you make ends meet? Like, what do you do? Because we were also experiencing a sort of, I think, you know, you may not get the same response from if you ask different members of the band, right? That's kind of the thing with being a band. People view the experiences they've had sometimes differently. Right. But I was like kind of wanting to pause and slow down. But that's a hard thing to do because a band in a lot of ways is like this giant container ship in the ocean. You know, you can't just like slow it down. Oh, um, there is pressure of touring and of like continuing to do things. And also there is you becoming increasingly aware of your art, you know, which, you know, if you come into this from like, with like punk aesthetic and credentials, you never want it to get too big or you never want like, you know, label mandates and, you know, expectations to sort of start to have more of an impact than, than they should. So you start to get like really insular and want to protect your thing. So I think without, so basically the answer is yes, but it's, it's a bunch of different things that I think brought me to a point where for better or worse i felt like a hard cutoff was was necessary and that's not um an easy thing to do um and it wasn't like an overnight thing you know i think i sort of dabbled with it a little bit and then eventually was like i gotta i gotta focus on this thing i'm doing at home you know and i rerouted my sort of life around it you know i it's not like i stopped playing but i really went all in on this work that i was doing which was really you know, managing, managing restaurants. And I really like found a community in the, I mean, it's, you know, most people be like, really, you started working at a bar and that like took the place of being in a band, but you know, it's, it's hard out of context to give it the levity that it, that it had, but I just needed to do something different and invest myself in a different thing. Um, and just 
sort of dive head deep into into this parenthood thing that I was doing, you know. It makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, um, you know, like there's certain there's definitely things in life that um you can find community in a lot of stuff, you know, and and, and even you know, I've never worked in a restaurant, but uh that that job seems to be the kind of job that people playing bands often get. Um yeah. and, you know, our mutual friend Carson, you know, Carson was a oh, definitely. Yeah. restaurant guy. And I saw the community that arose around, around his, uh, you know, when he was working in the restaurant field and, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me actually. Yeah. So that's a, you know, that's, that's the piece of it. Um, but then like with all things, you know, you sort of get further along and you're like, Oh, was that like the right thing to do? You know, could there have been like some adult conversations and just like you know like if i'd taken just like a quick sabbatical and did some like quick fix therapy maybe I'd come up with some like better solutions at the time than just like you know quitting it um cold turkey like that so um there was vestiges of like missing it that i think the further along i got the more they just became manifest you know so I tried to do some other things musically and really very little resonates with something that has so much, um, so much importance in your life as like a band quite like that, you know, from having like a sort of like a main project that you do, um, and putting all your, all your passion into it. Um, it's hard to get something else going and for it to have that same sort of gravitas. So now you're back in the fold. So, uh, you know, so what, what kind of change, you know what I mean? Like, obviously your, 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 uh, your children are older, you know, and maybe that, I mean, so what, what actually changed your life to bring you back into the band? Um, Trevor's like, can I get a, <laughs> no, no, I'm good. <laughs> um, by the way, that shirt is, uh, is fantastic, man. The bolt throw shirt you're wearing. The boot. I'm sorry. I, I feel like no, I should say, hey, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. if they're listening, you know, they can be like, Oh, that's I doubt it. they listen to the <laughs> show and you know, and I have tons of bootleg shirts too, but it's sick actually. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was, I was starting to, to write some stuff, you know, and then, um, you know, Trevor and I were having a beer one night. Um, I had just actually gone to their, to their, the listening party for nighttime stories at a brewery that's right by our house. And I was like, man, this shit is great, you know, and you can hear like, stuff that sounds like things that you'd want to do you know and i'm just like man i really just gotta make some music with trevor that just became like a thing in my mind right like a seedling of an idea um it was a, a little bit of that uh that fear of missing out kind of vibe <laughs> yeah a little you know and then and it's it's less about like it's it's weird to hear it because it's this kind of out of body thing you know where you're like that sounds really familiar but it's not uh it's not familiar right so and i was like well you know past the past life is life's but maybe like maybe we could play music again right but that just was really tough to actuate for for a variety of reasons you know let alone that we really hadn't you know hung out too much and you know the 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 creative importance of, of pelican in all our lives was a, a great amount of time being spent together like an extension of the friendship you know not like a band where you're like Hey man, I saw your name on a board. Like, you know, I hear you're pretty good at the blues. Let's get together and just kind of see where it goes. You know, it wasn't anything like that. So it's always like an extension of a deep friendship. So um, you know, we we sort of stayed in in, in touch from that point. Um, I was sent, I also started to talk to Larry a little bit. You know, we were sending stuff kind of back and forth during the during the early stages of the pandemic. I just found myself writing in a way that I hadn't done in a long time. And you know, once you start, it just kind of it's like that sounded awful. Um, it was meant to be the sound of like a boulder of heavy riffs just pouring off of the back of a giant truck. It's a tectonic wave of intensity. Yeah, collapsing <laughs> universes, you know, yeah. <laughs> opening galaxies of riffs that just like bore down on my house and I couldn't close the windows. I was just like, let it in. So a lot of stuff just started to, to kind of come out and um, I just started recording stuff on my own at home and just tabling and just being like i'm just going to put this stuff on ice and just keep stacking and stacking and stacking and then you know i think trevor this where you might come in just in terms of where the narrative picks up um yeah. it's probably right about a year and a half ago at this point 
Yeah. Uh, so Laurent and I were like trying to get a side band off the ground, but Mike, as you know, I already have too many bands. So sure. it was like trying to carve out time sure. to make. Excuse me, Trevor. Can I can I just jump? Where where are you right now? I see like a drum set, and there's like you know. That's his house. That's your <laughs> house. <laughs> this, is, this is my office. This is where I work every day. That's my that's my wife. Full wife's. drum set in your office. Oh yeah, that's my wife's drum kit. Uh, this is like this is our jam room or uh, whatnot. Awesome. But it doesn't get doesn't get utilized nearly as much as perhaps it ought to considering i have something like this in my house um but we are doing some pelican stuff here tomorrow so that'll be good um so anyhow i yeah we were it was really hard to try and meet up with laurent there was just too much other stuff going on between work and kids and already having two or three other bands um so i as much as i was really wanted to get back into playing with Laurent it just seemed like an, an impossibility um but I I knew that he had this hunger for playing again that had reawoken in him uh, and every time we would hang out he would talk about playing music and wanting to play music um so when Dallas amicably split from the band um it didn't really the the seed was there that like I bet you Laurent would be open to doing stuff with us and we already had a tour booked uh so at that point it was more a matter of like hey dude do you think like you'd be open to playing six shows with the band because we have these shows coming up and like you know we'll see how it goes or whatever uh and we did and just the the uh the emotional gratification of that coming back together as a unit it just felt like I don't know. It's hard to hard to put into words because um, it felt like rediscovering an old joy or an old friendship or something that had been absent from your life for a long time. But it was also really different because uh, obviously we had all kept playing together and our style has shifted and evolved. And like Laurent was bringing a whole new range of experiences to his playing as well. And it was like as much as it was. A, the joy to rediscover this old material it also like was breathing with a new life as well um so at the end of that tour we asked Laurent about doing more and uh we did a, a few more things through to the fall and then we decided to just start writing again because uh you know we had a, a few things in our back pocket and I knew Laurent had a bevy of riffs that he had been working on uh and we've just been writing ever since so I never really knew uh, how you guys formed because I remember I just remember Pelican just being a you know, a band that um you know I was hip to all the Hydra Head stuff and um I remember you guys I didn't know you guys like in the late nineties or two thousand one or anything we just kind of all met like like around two thousand eight or nine or something like that so where did how did the band actually form like do you are you guys like you know childhood friends or you know what what's the story close I mean. Close. I mean, I, I moved to the States in 1995, um, started going to the university um, in Evanston where, you know, Trevor was living. Um, I was interested in seeking out other humans who were into punk and hardcore, preferably hardcore. Um, and it was a pretty small circle. I mean, it wasn't like you know, it would have been maybe 10 years prior in a small town. I mean, it was a good, good chunk of humans, but, um, you know, it's a small world. So you, you meet Trevor and then it wasn't too, too long before I met Larry. Um, and that circle kind of widened, you know, going to the same shows, hanging out, like in the same bands and stuff, sometimes not like in the same bands, but getting to different things. Um, but Trevor and I definitely in my, in my university days, like spent a, a good amount of time together. Um, you know, it, to a degree I was at his, um, at his folks house, like a lot, um, in, in the early days, even staying there sometimes during the summer when I couldn't go back home, um, because the terms of my visa and stuff were weird. Um, so yeah, we definitely, we hung out and, and we were friends and had started a, had done a couple of, you know, random projects whenever we could some stuff leaning like punky some stuff not and then eventually forming what was bloody tusk um which would have been like this sort of all-out 
kind of grind uh, meets sort of Japanese hardcore assault, you know, um, mostly for self entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, eventually shortened its name to Tuscan. But we were that Larry was the drummer pretty much. Yeah, well, yeah, the entire time. Um, and that was really our first um, band, the three of us. Um, and we were, you know, active regionally. <laughs> One might say, I mean, we, we went to California once. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did some, some fests and stuff, but, you know, no, like, major touring or whatever. Um, yeah, we mainly played every Chicago suburb one at a time. Yeah. I love that. I, I love how it's like in, in the early days of bands, like you don't actually play in the city, you play like, you know, the, the random. Yeah. So like like out here, it's like you're playing like Newark instead of playing in New York or something like that. Or, you know, you play out probably, in like Montclair, New Jersey or something, you know. Probably better shows as a result. But yeah, we had a, a, so many shows, so many flyers. Um, and we'd see each other at shows. Like you just didn't do anything socially that didn't involve the others. It was like, you're going to this show? Of course I'll be at the show. You know, are we practicing? Of course we're practicing. Like every moment was kind of spent doing this thing but um i was living with larry eventually um and just writing kind of some slower stuff on my own i was the bassist in in tusk and i was writing stuff on guitar that really didn't fit like at all and would have no no real place um in that band due to the velocity of it and kind of where we were going with it but um you know i showed larry some stuff and eventually Trevor was like, this is cool. Let's do this. Like just as a fun thing on the side, we didn't even know what we we're going to do with it. Um, I think at some point Brian joins because, you know, they're brothers. He's upstairs. He hears us playing. He's a guitar player, but he decides he's going to play bass. It just, you know, it kind of comes together in this very, I don't know, for me, it just seems very typical of, of the time. It's just like effortless, like, oh, here's a guy who lives on the same floor and He's everyone, everyone, plays, everyone plays guitar too. Everyone yeah. plays guitar. <laughs> he's brothers, he's we brothers of the other guy. And he, yeah, well, we were practicing at the, the Herweg's house in Des Plaines. So we were doing Tusk practice every Saturday. Uh, and then I think Laurent, you went and like had like stayed over on a Friday night, and that's when you wrote the song Mammoth. Probably, sure. And then like at Tusk practice the next day, uh you know, after practice, you were like, do you want to work on this thing? And it's like, okay. <laughs> and then Brian and Larry almost shared a bedroom. They were like, yeah, it was like, really close. There was like a, basically yeah. a partition between their two rooms. Uh, and so he's just there. And uh, yeah. And then before you knew it, we were every Saturday, we would do Tusk practice, 10 minute break, and then do Pelican practice. And it just went like that for years. And I, we owe so much, uh, to Lair Senior and Peg for putting up with so much fucking noise. Yeah, that it strangely enough, I remember a lot of the transitions just having weed as like a transition. It was like, all right, we're transitioning. <laughs> now we're doing the other band. So we slow it down. One of the interesting things, which I don't I don't even know if it's really part so much of the culture of playing music anymore, but um, I mean, you guys and you know myself. Uh, we all have a similar background in some ways. Um, you know, our first, I mean, we probably all really loved Judas Priest and like the Scorpions first, but we couldn't play well That's enough. Right. So then we got into punk rock music and stuff. Trevor went a different route, but I, I, I'm, I know, I, I know, Laurent, yeah. I know that you're a big Priest fan. So that's why I'm speaking I'm sure this directly to you. Yeah. This. yeah. I want to be KK Downing. I really do, but I, yeah. I just cannot. Yeah. I know you and I have spoken about this, I think, yeah. but, uh, but the, um, but all right. So the commonality though, is playing like punk rock and hardcore mm -hmm. and out of all the people that are in that little scene in the beginning, some people stay doing that music. You know what I mean? Some people are like happy to play, you know, integrity riffs and stuff like that and just keep running with that formula yet. Some people out of that same scene, they start doing different things. So I, I'm always interested to find out um, like what was like the point, like what was the, the sort of stimulus for, for you guys that kind of like, you know, pushed you in a different direction to be more expressive or explore different things that were different than, um, than just playing, you know, punk and hardcore and grind and stuff like that. You mean when we ex like just dove into the the pelican thing yeah because yeah. you, you guys had this kind of duality going on for a while 
Yeah, I, 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 you know, it's a bunch of different stuff for me, I guess. Um, I think that we, we all listen to so many different things. Some of, a lot of them don't overlap at all, but yet found um, a common language and when we were crafting music together. Um, and for me, slowing down was, or wanting to do slow things was really being impressed um, and impressed upon by, um, you know, bands like Earth and Goat Snake and stuff like that. And that was really, you know, you can remember sort of late 90s, like the Man's Ruin thing is happening, like Southern Lord is kind of just getting going, you know, High on Fire is coming out of sleep and stuff like there's, there's definitely like the beginnings of a lot of those things happening. And then even bands like ISIS coming on the grid, you know, and seeing them open for Neurosis and stuff, you're like, wow, slow is, is crushing. It has like a way to it that just any explorer of extreme music would want to, you would think would want to try to do that because it's such a, it's such like a polar opposite. So I think there was like just a general curiosity um, that didn't even feel forced. I mean, I don't remember having a conversation with either Trevor or Larry and them being like, oh, no, 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 we're sticking to grind. Like, that's our thing, you know, or we're, it's just gonna be fast all the time. There were even moments of, of Tusk that had some slower sort of breakdowny parts that breakdowny, that's not even a word, um, <laughs> yeah, that I think were much more about like one-eyed God prophecy, you know, Uranus and like the Bremen, like hardcore thing, you know, with Acme and Sistral and that kind of stuff. So um, I don't know that there was, you know, an interest in being discordance axis, uh, or anything like that, but certainly being into discordance axis influenced the fast parts and then being into this other stuff influenced some of the slower parts. And then me showing up with some like stonery slow riffs didn't seem awkward. It was like, okay, this is just like a different extreme thing to just try the strange thing is that it stayed instrumental that's probably going to be like the puzzle piece that's the weirdest one to figure out because i know we wanted a singer and we certainly like thought about getting one but like that's a tough thing to find really and we knew we didn't want a particular kind of like hardcore type of singer i don't know what we were really after because it's not like i was gonna you know what i mean it's just it's a tough thing to to land on so i think we just pushed further into the instrumental thing and then ultimately you start to fill the space because when you write um instrumentally versus writing four vocals i mean the exercise is completely different i can even sometimes hear bands um where i'm hearing riffs and i'm like there shouldn't be vocals over this riff it's like it's too busy or there's no room for the vocal melody or whatever you know it's it's um it's a tricky thing but um we yeah, we just, we, I, I really just remember liking it and just kind of sticking with it, not really overthinking it at the time. And I also probably can't remember why it pivoted to being mostly Pelican. Maybe it was a reception issue, not like a cell phone or whatever, being you know, like in terms of people being receptive to it. Um, there was immediate shows, you know, there was like, oh, you've got like a slow thing. Well, High on Fire is playing the fireside. So that's a show. You know, there were bigger shows immediately as a result of doing this particular sound that were pretty big shows for us at the time in terms of exposure even if there was only like 30 people there you know but we also accidentally like cracked open an entire audience that didn't exist before because um like like Laurent said it was not intentional to be an instrumental band but after a few months of playing out and we were starting to draw bigger audiences even if it was you know, going from 30 people to 50 people or 80 people or whatever. It was like, we kept hearing again and again, like, oh, I've always like been interested in heavy music, but I'm turned off by the screaming and stuff like that. Yeah, and so we we were like creating this whole new niche of, of heavy music in Chicago uh, amongst people that had previously been kind of closed off to it in a sense. And Chicago was really receptive to it for sure, because of, I think, its own history with experimental and you know outlier music in general and just the bevy of like labels that are here and stuff i i, I remember a lot of just like a, a an embrace from 
from all from the very like disparate types of audience people you know just looking out and being like wow this is actually a very diverse crowd you know um and and not necessarily metal ish to begin with i mean sometimes we would play out of town more metal kinds of shows and people be like oh didn't expect you know you guys to look like this <laughs> Expect you guys to have like 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 leather pants and stuff like that. No, I don't know what the expectations were, but they might have you know maybe the hair was longer, the clothes were darker or something. I'm not sure, but um, or maybe more tattoos or whatever. But it it just it was like it, it immediately felt like Chicago was like a kind of a good a good home to for this to kind of grow and become a different thing. Yeah, Chicago has always been. I mean, if you go through my record collection. You know, you'll you'll find uh, you know articles of faith. You'll find shellac in there. You know, big black. You know, naked ray gun, tar. Like these are all bands that don't even sound alike, but they have like yeah. Chicago. To me, has always had a very unique um, sort of vibe. And even the, like the more extreme bands, like um, you know, like Indian and you know bands like that, have a very. Have you guys ever played with them? Just out of curiosity. In the past, yeah. I'm yeah, I can sure. see that. Yeah. yeah. The, the other thing, too, is I never really, it's funny, like, all these years, I just think of Pelican as a band. Like, I don't even think of you guys as an instrumental band. You know, it's not like, okay, there's, I like instrumental music, you know, and, you know, like Goblin or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree with you. I yeah. just, I listen to shit, like, to me, Pelican's just been a band that, oh, yeah, there's no vocals. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I'm flattered by your by your looking at it that way, certainly because we never viewed it as being restrictive. It was just there's no vocals. So we're we're gonna do our thing with these four, these three instruments, you know. Um even I mean, I think there was moments where we talked about like incorporating other types of elements and stuff, but it never felt it never really took off, you know. It just stayed even now, like coming back to it with this many years of distance, it's just a bass, two guitars and drums. And there's not like a plethora of keyboards and like fucking other stuff, you know, to fill out the space. It's just, I rolled up to show Trevor some riffs and it was just like, here's my guitar with a pick. Here's the, here's the riff, you know, just the same way that it was um, years back. And that may be, shows how you know maybe some people may be like well that's a li like a limited thing to to do you know you'd think after like 20 years of doing it this way but i'm like but i've still i don't feel like i'm really running out of ideas or like ways to to do this thing so i'm just going to keep doing it the way that it feels correct so with these uh these reissues uh through thrill jockey it's it's all the it's the it's the hydrahead stuff that's coming out right because the, the southern lord stuff is still um in print right trevor yeah that's right yeah, yeah it was just uh hydrahead stopped doing they stopped maintaining the label and um they kind of released everybody's masters back out into the wild and we we uh we kind of examined our options and we wanted to, to work with thrill jockey because they have such a rich history in in chicago and we were interested in I think we were interested in the Chicago-ness of that era of the band. Um, so that seemed like a really natural home for him. So, um, Laurent. Yeah. First show back with the band. Okay. Yeah. Deep breaths. <laughs> what was that like, man? Honestly, because it's like, um, uh, you know, not having been probably on stage for a while, you know? Yeah, so, um, you know, different parts of your brain do different things. You know, you've got that part of your brain that's like pragmatic, problem solving. You know, you've got that sort of reptile-like part of your brain that's just your, you know, your defense responses and stuff. But on the right side of your brain, on your creative side, you've got like the flow state and you're just in the moment. The first 10 minutes, you're just like, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm going to forget every fucking note from all these practices like there's absolutely no reason for me to be up here this is ridiculous and then you're just like oh wait a minute okay then you just settle into your thing you know like a lot of shows um it was a very like i almost kind of want to go back and do it again for it's how lucky you just kind of feel to just rejoin an, an, an existing narrative that you were a part of 
and can now be a part of it again. Like, you know, it's like exiting a book and then it's like, you thought the character was dead, but he's back six chapters later. <laughs> <laughs> you know, turns out he wasn't a villain at all. They're just misunderstood. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just uh, all the weight that you'd expect from, you know, some t- touching on some of the themes that Trevor brought up earlier, but, you know, it's it's the exaltation of like friendship and and the, all the drama of it in, in the best way. And I mean, we all like to play on stage because it's loud and it's thick and it's like rich and cathartic and you're just like enveloped in sound. Um, and, you know, we're not like choreographed or, or themed performers. It's just, certainly there's a lighting that seems to be kind of a nice conduit to what we do uh but that's really the extent of it so it's just about the four people and the music and it's always kind of been that way you know the stages change the mix gets better as you go um but it's just that thing it's like that's like a facsimile of that thing that it was before and so that um was really transportive and and pretty amazing and just doing the same material, but with the benefit of like distance and the wisdom that you get from from age and the distance from things. Um, you know, I know I'm speaking in these sort of like vague terms, but I think it, I think I think you know what I'm trying to say. Um, it was super cool. It was super cool. It was great. Um, and then the the shows after that, just because they were informed with this first good hometown show as like an as like an inception point for rejoining, um, they were probably better for me as a result of it you know it's like if the first show was just like a bust on some some performance level or whatever it would have been like you know maybe that seed of doubt would have been there but that didn't that didn't really happen and so I think especially the European stuff you know after which like all European tours was fraught with occasional moments you know of like wow, there's a lot of cars on this road. None of them are moving and the show starts in a half hour, right. you know, or like, we you know, random stuff or like just like, you know, layovers and missed, uh, you know, connections. But um, every show was played and they were just like, it was like just rolling with it. Uh, and so that was great. Um, and to rediscover it for that um, and to re-engage in it um, in that way was, was really amazing. Um, and, you know, we're all looking forward to, to doing more so yeah i was going to europe man i mean it's uh it just seems like logistically these days touring in europe at least for the you know at least for now is is uh is is kind of challenging so how is organizing that whole operation well it was weird because it was you know still kind of the tail end of uh well the tail end i mean it's it was very much like a covid time still um and so there was, you know, challenges with that logistically and, and in terms of, you know, health concerns and things, um, choosing to still do it and, you know, testing all the time and and trying to make it work. Um, and but the shows, the shows themselves were 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 great. You know, it's I mean, I hope to to go back there and, and again, do it um, in a different um, a different light, you know, just back to. But I mean, it's been it's been years. I'm not sure. I'm sure we'll get back there eventually. Yeah, I, I imagine you guys will. You know. So the the next thing that you guys have coming up um, is this uh, this Three Floyds uh, Dark Lord Festival, which I've always wanted to play, but I've never had an opportunity to do that. So past that, is there any any plans for uh, for any more live stuff coming up coming down the line? I believe. The day before this podcast comes out, we will have announced uh, a four oh. show tour in the Midwest, or hopefully it turns out to be four shows. I don't know. One of them will be uh, Chicago Metro. We're going to do a big release party for uh, the Fire in Our Throats reissue. Um, and then from there, I think we're going to try and focus more on new stuff and uh, and kind of close down the retrospective period of our band. Nice. Um, but yeah, because we've been making tons of progress on new songs. We're like six songs deep. Um, so yeah, I think we want to shift the focus to that and hopefully make a new record and then think about touring from there. 
That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. You know, it's not just like this, uh, you know, how like bands get together and they have these reunion tours and it's like, like Motley Crue or something, you know, they have like, uh, you know, their farewell tour that happens like 10 years in a row. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the thing that's funny is like, we've been doing this band. Um, I mean, and obviously not continuously for Laurent, but we've been doing the band for 20 years now. And yeah. uh, the pandemic. Over 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. And the pandemic was the first time that we like ever had to hit the pause. We, we've always been, what's the next thing? What's the next project? What's the next tour? What's the next album? What's the next song? And we've never been in a retrospective mode before. So when we, uh, when the pandemic hit and Hydra had, we're like, okay, your records are going out of print. You need to find a new home for them. And we kind of, that became the focus of the band for a while was just like reactivating these old songs and like doing archival work and digging up old tracks and like digitizing tapes and and all this stuff that went into making the reissues and it's really the first time i think that we've taken stock of the band and where we've been and and where the journey that it took to get to where we are now um and <laughs> But, but now we've been doing that for three years. So I feel like it's exciting to now uh, yeah. be done with this retrospective period and yeah. to move on to the next thing, because that's that's what's always been exciting for this band. And that's always been what we've been about is just like the, the next music, the next batch of tunes. Yeah, because I know I know like you and I, you know, we've been in touch over the last few years and, um, you know, you're, you're I, I was always hearing about the brand new reissue and stuff. I'm like, all right, OK, all right, great. You know, this is good, but uh, when are we get some new material? You know, that was, I was waiting for that announcement. So that's good to hear. I'm happy about that. But but that's not to downplay the, this last reissue. We're really excited about it because the Fire in Our Throats is a record that has always, it was our biggest record of that era in terms of sales. And the fact that that was like the first moment that we had like a legitimate feeling of success outside of Chicago where we were touring and like people were turning up um but the record always sat weird because the mix didn't really sit right for us uh so it was kind of like this mixed bag where it's like such a, a big and important record for us but it was hard to listen back to and uh and greg norman who originally engineered the album uh when i i brought him the tapes to di digitize them uh he he offered to just remix the whole record and it's in a similar way that we're now approaching playing these songs with a new skill set and with a new level of comfort in our abilities, uh, he's got a whole new skill set and comfort in his abilities as an engineer, and he was able to bring that to to mixing the album again. And I think that was um, part of the joy is that it was that we did it with the person that did it originally. So he is still he was very much in the same headspace, you know, as we were in terms of what we were trying to achieve with the album. So it was it was really rad to hear what he was able to bring to the table with these, and I'm I'm really excited for people to hear this. It's an excellent opportunity to have because um, I, I I'm sure anyone who plays in a band, you know, and that when their record comes out and they listen to it, and there's always like, oh man, I wish we you know did did something different, but hardly anyone ever has an opportunity to actually have the album remixed and presented again. So that that's really cool. I'm glad that you know. That, that's all that's awesome I, you know i wish i could remix all all of the records i play <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that was a weird record because we did it i want to say we did the whole the record in seven days with mix like maybe four days tracking and then three days mixing and then in the middle of it we were like in the middle of the night we tracked the <laughs> tusk album oh wow it was like that's, uh, uh, that's that sounds uh, kind of insane. Actually, yeah, it was like eleven o'clock, and we were eating dinner, and we didn't know when we would ever record this Tusk album. And Brian was like, "I'm going," and then we were like, "Okay, do you want to just uh, play Swing this Tusk album real quick? Just let's let's record this album real quick." <laughs> it was one one thirty five minute long song, so it was <laughs> like you know just run it. And <laughs> <laughs> Is there any um any uh, like uh, supplemental material being released on there? Like anything in addition, like bonus tracks or anything like that on this record? Um, I wish I had the track list in front of me. Maybe I can pull it up. There, there are a few bonus things. Laurent, you want to talk about it while I find the track list? No, you'll have to refresh. My memory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I can't we're say not, we're not we're not in promo mode yet. You you got us on yeah. our first. I, I can't say that's that. all right, man. I can't even remember the names of the titles of the songs like that. Like I, I still refer to like all of our songs by their working titles. Like when we write a set list. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're the worst with that. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there are four bonus tracks. I think if I remember right, one of them is on the vinyl uh, and then the other three come as a digital download with the vinyl. And then the digital version, I think will be all 11 tracks, um, but they're comprised uh, there's three demos from when we we demoed the whole album with Greg Norman at his home studio uh, before we went in. And then there was also a session that we did with him at Electrical Audio the year before we made the album, which was the March into the Sea EP. And then we did an alternate version of Red Ran Amber. Um, and that alternate Ran Amber is on the on on there as well. That's pretty cool. I'm, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to picking that up. Definitely. But, you know, it's, it's complicated these days with all this, you know, the digital has this and then, you know, it's not yes. like you can just buy like a, a CD anymore. And there's like a, you know, some CD ROM version of it or something, you know, well, do you remember they, they used to do that with like CDs or uh, like yeah. a video or something on there? The enhanced mm -hmm. portion. The enhanced you, portion of the CD. <laughs> that you could access if you had the right hardware, you know, it was, <laughs> The, the the gallery of photos <laughs> yeah you know trevor i have this memory that i always think about um when i i think it, i forgot which tour it was but we were in portland and um you had gone to uh voodoo donuts and uh i had never actually been to voodoo donuts and um i remember you came back with this big like box of donuts but you didn't offer any to any, any of the donuts to anyone else because they were, I think they were vegan donuts or something like that. And I was like, I remember being like, you know what? I, I used to like Trevor, man, but he's a selfish guy. I, when it comes to, <laughs> to treats, yeah, I'm a vegan treat hoarder. It's true. I'm, and I apologize. Oh, I've, I've seen the error of my ways, but if I had that box of donuts today, I can't say as I would offer the donuts. <laughs> but, you know, at least I acknowledge the wrongdoing here. Yeah. Actually, one one of my favorite, um, another this is this is a very very you know this isn't a wise guy sort of comment, but I remember being in Toronto, man. And we had jumped. I think you guys still had some more dates. It was the ISIS tour with you guys and us, and and uh, it was Toronto, and we were we were leaving, and I think you guys were you had a couple more dates or whatever, and I was just like, man, this is like one of the coolest experiences. Well, you know, further, first of all, because the shows are always great, but also just getting to meet everyone. And um, like I'd known the ISIS guys for a while, but um, I think that's kind of like when I feel like we've like solidified, solidified our friendship a little bit on that tour. And I was just like, man, I'm going to miss these guys. It's like you, know, you spend a month seeing these dudes every single day. And then now I'm going back home and, you know, back to the salt mine, you know. So, um, yeah, I just thought that was really cool. And I was, you know, really happy to know you guys, you know. Well, likewise, I never yeah. knew you worked in a salt mine. Yeah, they have. Um, I worked in the. It's uh, not too many people know about the Brooklyn salt mines. <laughs> and uh, you know, I did my time in the Brooklyn salt mines for a couple of years. You know, I don't like to talk about it too much. <laughs> the real, real, un real underground thing. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's uh, you know, it you have to know a guy to get a job there. Yeah, you know, there's Himalayan pink salt, there's sea salt, and there's Brooklyn salt. Yeah, Brooklyn salt, black. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, a lot of those, a lot of those tours. There's there's so much to to remember fondly, and then some things you just like can't remember, but wish you could remember. You know, things bleed into each other day after day, but um, certainly do miss the the immersion of the long tour experience you know because you sort of feel like you exist in just the time and place that you're in and everything else just kind of melts away you know until you you go home to you know the the responsibilities you have there but in that capsule that like travels the country you're just it's just you and the homies yeah well thanks guys um this is great catching up with everyone and um yeah when this when this comes out uh the record will be available for purchase, I believe.
So, I think a um, pre-order so yeah. will be up by then. Yeah. 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 Pre-order will be up, and uh, you guys will have announced some dates, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, which is awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, Laurent, hopefully, uh, another decade doesn't go by. No, our paths will cross. Again. Yeah, I <laughs> certainly our paths will cross sooner than later. I'm I'm quite sure of it. I really enjoyed catching up, and you know, thanks for thanks for asking all the questions, getting to the grit. That's what we do here at Everything Went Black. We ask questions. <laughs> Deep <laughs> questions. And Trevor, I'm sure uh, you and I'll be in touch. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure I'll text you some questions about esoteric literature or like send you some links to hip hop records or whatever. Actually, I thanks. Thank you very much, man. Because like uh, I, you know, I that's been a really good deep dive for me because I, I kind of fallen out of, um, you know, like uh, I used to really love hip hop and now I'm back in the swing of it, you know? I mean, I went to that Vinnie Paz show a few weeks ago, and uh, right. now I'm like, you sent me a bunch of links of stuff that I've, you know, real underground stuff that I didn't even know about, so that's really cool. Well, let's keep the keep the thread going. Hell yeah, guys. All right, dudes, have a good evening, and uh, right. we'll see you soon. Take All care. Right, take now. care. Thank you, man. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.
un, under what circumstances would you be on a Zoom call with 30 people? Uh, uh, giving a seminar or something like that? Yeah. Uh, it typically involves like a, a major label. Oh, okay. See, I, I don't roll like you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know the people that, you know, the the worst zoom, uh, I was ever on was, it was like, um, the year that they brought the Grammys back, but it was like, uh, still during the myth, the height of COVID. So they weren't letting publicists, uh, into the Grammys and like, they weren't doing any, like, uh, like in-person interviews. So all the interviews were going to be on Zoom uh, that would normally be on the red carpet. So they had to do a seminar for all of the publicists at the Grammys. And it was like something like 600 or 700 people. And uh, and like I, I was one of maybe 10 people that left the camera on. I don't know, most people had the, the, the self-dignity to do.